Dear ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I don't know what you say in Ireland at about 12, 1230. Uh, in Vienna, we say Mahlzeit, which means lunchtime. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thanks for inviting me to share the Viennese experience with you. And uh, in the next couple of minutes, I will try to take you for a, let's say, a virtual journey to Vienna. Now, uh, who's been to Vienna already? OK. Wow. Um, I guess most of you have been walking around the historical center, the beautiful Baroque historical center. And the pictures you have when I talk about Vienna are mostly related to the historical center, I guess. And Vienna is the capital city of music. But Vienna at the same time is a metropolis in Central Europe. And as a matter of fact, uh, right now, one of the fastest growing cities in the German-speaking area. Um, we're competing with Berlin. Um, most years, actually right now, Berlin is growing a little bit faster than Vienna, but there's been several years within this decade uh, that Vienna was growing even um, quicker uh, at a much faster pace than Berlin. We're growing uh, at, about, at a pace of about 25,000 uh, people who choose to become Viennese each and every year. Uh, which, of course, is an honor, and it's a huge opportunity, but it means for us um, creating a small town. A small Austrian town is 25,000 people approximately. So it means building a small town with everything this means and everything it needs each and every year. Um, now, this clearly is a challenge in many respects. I will be focusing on transport uh, today, uh, but I will be maybe uh, addressing a few other issues as well. Now, you may have also heard that Vienna is regularly ranked as the most livable city in the world. Um, according to Mercer, um, we have the first place, we've had the first place and held it for the past 10 years in a row, which makes us very proud. But um, I guess um, you may be a little bit skeptical about counting livability with points. And you may be right. So um, when it comes to talking about quality of life, I would like to get a little bit more precise. Um, now, clearly, there's, um, there's a whole governance issue that goes with it. Um, there is an urban development plan, um, like every city has one. Um, and for the sake of uh, these 20, 20, 25 minutes that I have, I will be not going deeper into this. I just would like to invite you all, in case you're interested, uh, to take a look at it. There is an English version of it on the website of the city of Vienna. And there are many, many uh, thematic, specific strategic concepts that go with it, focusing on mobility and transport, focusing on green and open spaces, public spaces, high-rise buildings, um, city centers, uh, polycentric strategy, you name it. There are about, I don't know, almost 20 different thematic concepts that go with it. Um, so feel free uh, to look it up in case uh, you want to have some deeper information. I, though, uh, will be talking now about the guiding principles that we have and why I believe that we managed to become city number one and stay this uh, for so many years. And of course, uh, I will be not addressing all issues that go with it. Once again, I could never do so in 20 minutes. Now. The central idea that we had is, we said that a city is a place where people live because they want to and not because they have to. Um, in terms of what is it that we mean when we talk about quality of life. And then to get a little bit more precise, the leading, the guiding principle is, we want to be a city that's good for children. Now, why actually? Well, we say a city that's good for children is good for everybody. It's a good city for every generation. Why? Because we all want our children to grow up in a safe environment. We want them to grow up in a green environment, to have contact to nature. We want them to be able to move around freely and enjoy life, right? These are the things we all long for. And we say we have to provide for these qualities within the heart of the city itself. Because if we do so, then this is most probably the most powerful answer we have 
in order to avoid suburbanization, which is one of the hugest problems that cities are facing right now. Of course, there are issues of affordability when it comes to avoiding suburbanization. But if you've, let's say, solved the affordability issues, as we have almost done in Vienna, um, then it has really to do with qualities of everyday life. And it has to do with transforming the city, transforming public spaces in the city, providing for vast green accessible open spaces um, so that young couples want to stay in the city, want to raise the children in the city. And I believe that this is the kind of city we all want to live in. And this is where we live because we want to and not because we have to. Uh, and then there's a famous quote by Jane Jacobs that, have been, that has been very influential to me. Uh, she said, the outside of the buildings is the inside of the city. And um, this is the third leading principle when it comes to our focus, to our really very, very strong focus on qualities of public space. Realizing that open spaces and that planning spaces in the city is actually so central to everyday quality of life. And we are also obsessing with architecture. We're also obsessing with buildings and objects and their qualities. We have been obsessing on this historically in European cities. But I think that, let's say, the revival of the European city, of a growing European city today, also means focusing on the qualities of public space. Now, you may be asking yourselves, what does this have to do with transport and mobility? I say everything. Because, oh, this is just another picture I have brought. But let's say, this is a very good picture to discuss this, because it's about space. I mean, there are many, many issues that we could talk about when it comes to transport. Um, and yes, um, it is clearly about life quality, as I have already pictured. Um, it has a lot to do with time management. Um, you can ask me later, but I have calculated that uh, in most European cities, all of us will most probably spend a second holiday in traffic congestion. Um, so if I gave you a second holiday, how would you rather spend it? Um, I guess not sitting in your cars. Anyway, uh, so it's about time management. It's about decarbonization. Uh, it's clearly the most powerful tool that cities hold in their hands when it comes to decarbonization traffic management, mobility management. Of course, uh, buildings um, or everything that has to do with heat or cooling in the summer is also an issue. But in many cases, because of governance issues, cities may not be able um, to uh, take decisions upon this themselves. Whereas when it comes to transport, um, it's always an issue that clearly uh, lies in the hands of cities. So it is a very powerful tool. Um, it is about air quality and health, but I always say it is first and foremost about space. It's about space management. If we need space, uh, let's say for trees, which is also an issue right now, climate adaptation and heat summer days, and so many cities needing uh, space to plant trees, then you suddenly find out um, that there is no space for trees or there is so huge controversy because you need space for parking slots, right, on the first surface. And I don't know how it is in Ireland, but I can tell you the most valuable currency in Vienna is parking space. If I want to plant trees or if I want to put a cycling lane in the street, the first question that I will have posed to me is, how many slots will it cost, right? Not how much money will it cost. How many parking space will it cost? So you see, it is about space management and it is about uh, reallocating space. And um, this is, once again, a very, very valuable currency in cities because, in, especially in historical parts of the city, you can't make more of it. It's just there, and it's already in use, and it's so scarce, so you have to find other ways uh, of using it, and you have to take decisions. Now, uh, here are model split uh, targets, and as you can see for yourselves, uh, there has been quite a dramatic development uh, for the better uh, within the last decades. Um, right now, 40% of all everyday trips has been done, almost 40%, by public transport. Uh, it is only 27% uh, that are being done by private car. 
uh, we're at uh, 7% um, cycling, um, and the rest goes uh, for walking. Uh, what we want to achieve is that by 2025, 80% uh, of all everyday trips are done in an ecological way, uh, and we're on a good way. Now, how did we do it? First of all, um, of course, public transport is uh, the backbone of a city's mobility strategy. In our case, uh, we're in the privileged position to have had very smart ancestors, which means that they took the decision to invest in uh, metro uh, back in the 70s, but at the same time, they took the decision to keep the tramway. Uh, back then, many, many cities made the mistake um, to skip, uh, to drop the idea of the tramway, uh, and they are reintroducing the tramway now. Now, in our case, we have, as you can see, several metro lines. Uh, we have 29 tramway lines, and we keep expanding them. Uh, of course, several buses, and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, let me jump to this, we have one of the densest public transport networks uh, that there are uh, for a city this size. So uh, you can reach the next uh, station uh, well, approximately within 300 to 500 meters and uh, within the denser parts of the city, um, you never have to wait for anything for longer than three to five minutes until it arrives. Uh, but still, this is how people are. They love the cars. In German-speaking areas, they love the cars even more than anywhere else in the world. So they would love taking the cars because it's convenient, um, especially when it's raining. I don't need to tell you the story. Um, so. We needed to come up with an idea how to take people out of their cars and make them use their feet and make them use public transport more. Um, and this is the idea we came up with. Uh, we said, well, let's make the public transport annual card cheaper. And we made it cheaper indeed. Right now it costs only 365 euro per year, which means that for this, you can go, this is what it looks like, this is mine, and you can go for this anywhere you want in Vienna, as often as you want, each and every day. And that was a good deal. It worked brilliantly. It worked, though, in combination with expanding parking space management to the suburbs. So right now, about two-thirds of the total Viennese area have parking space management, which means that it is definitely much, much quicker and more convenient and cheaper to use public transport than, than to use one's own car. Um, and this really was a wow. Uh, within two years, the, 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 the number of annual card holders more than doubled. So right now, we are at more than 800,000 annual card holders, plus the students that have even cheaper fares, plus the pupils that have even cheaper fares, so this means altogether we have more than one, people, one million people out of a population of two million. Uh, not even yet two million. We're projected to be two million up to the year 2025. So out of a population of less than two million, we have more than one million annual card holders. And once you have the annual card, you use it, of course. Uh, so this really meant that within two years, we had a shift of 3% within the model split uh, in favor of um, public transport. Um, and um, of course, um, I, I, I just have to say it works. Um, now, we are a cycling city. We're not a front runner exactly, but um, we have been investing a lot um, in, in cycling infrastructure. We have a network of uh, um, about 1,400 um, kilometers. Um, this is what it looks like. And um, um, 200,000, more than 200,000 cyclists within the season. Um, still, it's a controversy um, when it comes um, to, to introducing cycling lanes, especially once again in historical parts of the city. Uh, where you have so little space. So it is an issue of reallocating space, of course. We're a sharing city. We introduced, encouraged and introduced um, car sharing, um, well, approximately 10 years ago. 
So right now we have more than 100,000 customers um, and um, more than 1,300 cars. Um, so we're just about right now in the process of introducing e-car sharing, um, which needs infrastructure. So we have invested in infrastructure as well. Uh, we are creating, in the process of creating 1,000 e-mobility charging stations uh, in public space uh, right now. Um, now, there is an issue that goes with this because um, I have to, clear, to be clear about this. I believe that e-mobility um, is something that is um, directly linked to um, charging cars not in public space, but actually in garages where they should be um, well, parked at night or in many cases throughout the day. But right now we're in a transition period and it does make sense to introduce strategically um, a certain number, which is of course different from city to city, of charging stations in public space, uh, also as a, as a means of raising awareness. Uh, but that's a, that's a discussion that goes with it. We decided to go for it, and we're introducing them in, strategic, in strategical spots. Um, and we're a city made for walking. Now, 56% of all trips include walking in Vienna. And we said, um, if, you, if you want to find out if public space is um, working well in terms of walking, is it attractive enough that people will choose to go on foot and will choose it against other options that they may have? Then I believe that if a public space is working well, then this is a place where you can actually measure how people slow down their pace while walking. Uh, because there's something to see there. There's something to experience there. It might be even so attractive that they even choose to spend a little time there, to sit down and have a chat with somebody. Um, so we monitored um, many, many different places in Vienna um, in terms of their qualities and found out where are places that work beautifully, where are places that have poor quality, and where are uh, so-called transitory known spaces, where you can actually see that people will walk through them, will cross them as quickly as possible, um, normally looking nervous in every direction, you know, um, and to leave them as quickly as possible. And um, we decided to invest money in redoing uh, these places. So there's a whole pro program that goes with it, where each and every year we will invest a certain sum and um, redo one specific uh, space somewhere in the city. Now, um, this for instance is one example. This is what it looked like. Europe, Central Europe's longest shopping street. Can you detect anything smart here? Is it where you would go for a walk with your children? Or if I gave you a folding table and a few chairs, would you decide to spend lunch time there? No, I guess. This is what it looks now, like now. And that really, um, I think that, that this shows the difference of what I'm talking about. Um, once again, you need space in order to do this. And this also means making public transport attractive, as attractive as possible, because this is the biggest space saver uh, that a city can have. Um, now, when it comes to new urban quarters, um, and this is the last thing I will be talking about, we, uh, I mentioned in the beginning that uh, we have to build a small town uh, each and every year to accommodate up to 25, 26,000 new arrivals. Um, and we do so, but we said we want new urban quarters to be for the benefit, not only for the people who are going to be living there, we want them to be for the benefit of the whole city and of the people already living in their nearby vicinity. So we create new urban quarters are always according to a few design principles which are creating vast accessible, open green spaces that can be used by everybody, not only by the people who live there, so no gated communities, 
Uh, we introduced uh, well, social housing, affordable, highly affordable housing, up to two thirds uh, in each and every one of these new urban quarters. Um, we uh, developed them always along uh, the axis of um, high level public transport. Um, and we see to it uh, that car parking, collective car parking, is always located at the edges. And uh, within the urban quarter, there's a strong focus on the quality of public spaces, walking and cycling, just to give you a few examples of how this is done. This is one example of the master plan uh, for uh, one new urban quarter um, that um, is being um, developed um, right now. Well, it is almost done. This is uh, the, the, the new central railway station in Vienna. Um, it is a quarter of mixed uses, and what you can see here uh, is, has a very strong focus on the residential parts. The high-rise parts is uh, where the office uh, buildings is. Uh, this is what it looks like, like now, but uh, it's quite terrible. The park is not <laughs> in the picture, so you cannot see it. Um, but it just gives you an idea of, of, of uh, how these quarters are being uh, managed and implanted uh, within the tissue of the city. Um, yes, and uh, thank you. Thanks for listening.